a Chinese water torture game on him. He let out little words. He was going to get this guy. And Bruce comes in and he gives him the silent treatment, you know, and he's grumbling around and he said, you know, it's Bert thought he's just going to lose his temper and just destroy him. Adam said that Bert Ward was just shaking in his shorts. He was so scared that Bruce was going to take after him. Ultimately, the producers ended the battle in a draw to avoid upsetting fans of either show. None too smart for a smart crime fighter. Are we just letting them go, Batman? But it didn't matter. The Green Hornet was canceled after just one season. That was unquestionably a big blow to Bruce Lee. He had hoped that the show would be more successful. He had hoped to use that as a springboard, and it didn't work out. With the cancellation of the Green Hornet, the future was once again uncertain. And despite a new legion of loyal fans and the powerful contacts he had made in the entertainment industry, Bruce Lee would again be facing tough times. Now 27, Bruce had hoped the Green Hornet would open doors for him. Instead, he found work only sporadically making a few guest appearances in shows like Here Come the Brides. I did not meet the ship because I refused to marry a woman I've never seen. Lin Soon, decision, not yours. The society arranges all marriages. I am no longer a part of the society. I resigned. Perhaps you wish to speak to Chi Pei. You could explain your reasonings to him. I will explain nothing to Chi Pei. Now, I am no longer a member of the society. Is that understood? Unable to find work as an actor, he hired himself out as a fight coordinator on films like The Wrecking Crew, starring Dean Martin. Those years were very difficult to break into Hollywood. There became a racial barrier that prevented him from crossing over into the Hollywood establishment. Frustrated and with a family to support, Bruce turned to his friend Green Hornet producer Charles Fitzsimons for advice. And I said, well, wait a minute, Bruce, I have an idea. I said, how about teaching people in their own homes where you don't have to have a studio? And I explained to him all of the middle-aged, would-be, uh, macho uh, individuals in the motion picture industry and in business. These are your potential clients. Now attracting celebrity students like James Coburn, Steve McQueen, and basketball legend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bruce became the hottest martial arts coach in Hollywood. He was not like most of the other people in the martial arts who had a tendency to be very formal and stiff. He was very down to earth, uh, very American when you were working out and he always wanted to make the most use of your time together with him. Uh, you had to have done your homework and be ready to go. But of all of Bruce's pupils, his favorite was his son Brandon. Brandon was a mositong, couldn't sit still little kid. And as soon as he could walk, Bruce was having him learn kicks and punches and all that kind of thing. And Brandon had endless amounts of energy, just like his dad. As proud as Bruce was of his son, he was equally proud of his second child, daughter Shannon, born April 19, 1969. She was as much a girl as Brandon was a boy. Uh, Shannon just had Bruce around her little finger. Daddy's little girl. It was like an angel had come to live at our house when Shannon was born. It's funny, but I guess when Bruce Lee is your dad, he's your dad. We weren't the sort of kids that went around saying, well, my dad's Bruce Lee and he could, you know, beat up your dad. <laughs> Even though I'm sure that's true for the most part. <laughs> Despite what his children thought, Bruce was not invincible. One morning in 1970, while working out with weights, he injured a major nerve in his back, which left him unable to train for six months. Frustrated, he poured his energy into refining his philosophy of Jeet Kune Do and began writing extensively on every aspect of martial arts combat. Doctors came to Bruce with devastating news. They told him that he would never be able to perform martial arts again. Vowing to prove them wrong, Lee, once healthy enough to train, set up an exhaustive daily fitness regimen. 
What he did, again, uh, turning a stumbling block into a stepping stone, he wanted to see just what the limitations uh, and capabilities of the human body were. He would do 2,000 punches a day, you know, 1,000 kicks a day. He would uh, run three miles and get on a bike and bike 15 miles. All of it was pushing to see what the human body was truly capable of. Anxious to get his acting career back on track, Bruce worked closely with screenwriter Sterling Siliphant and actor James Coburn on a film idea entitled The Silent Flute. Bruce had originated the idea for a screenplay that he called The Silent Flute. Warner Brothers was interested in doing it. It was the picture that was going to break Bruce into Hollywood. And we lived on that hope for several years there in the difficult years. So that was a crushing disappointment to Bruce when that film was never made. Still teaching martial arts, Bruce felt Hollywood had turned its back on him as an actor. Looking for work, he traveled to Hong Kong to promote himself and meet with Asian filmmakers. Run Run Shaw was the biggest Asian filmmaker. Unfortunately, the bid was a, a standard offer that he offered his contract players, which was like $200 a week uh, for about seven years. Well, that wasn't what Bruce was looking for, so he politely declined. Back in Hollywood in 1971, Bruce collaborated with Sterling Siliphant on a script for TV's popular Longstreet series. Guest appearing as a martial arts master, Bruce was in fact so well received by the show's producers that he was offered a recurring role. But by now, Lee's status in Asia had changed. On a trip back to Hong Kong, he was astonished to discover that the Green Hornet had become hugely popular. Asian fans now referred to it as the Cato Show. And when he arrived there, thousands of people would come to the airport. He couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed the way that uh, Tom Cruise, I guess, today might be mobbed if he walked down on the street. As a result of his newfound fame, Bruce was asked to star in a film for top Asian producer Raymond Chow. Bruce expressed that he would like very much to come back to Hong Kong to make pictures. And I called him on the phone and we started a conversation. The whole thing clicks. Then uh, we signed a three picture deal and he came back and the rest is history. Bruce's first assignment for Raymond Chow was as the star of a modestly budgeted martial arts film entitled The Big Boss. Introducing Bruce Lee. Every limb of his body is a lethal weapon against man. With savage beasts. Hong Kong moviegoers are renowned for being very vocal. <coughs> and they have even been known to, like, cut the seats with a knife or something if they didn't like the movie. So, we're sitting there. The crowd is hushed. And he thinks, for a second he thinks, oh my God, they hate it. The audience, I think, was sort of dumbfound at the end of the thing. Until everybody broke out into thunderous uh, applause. The big boss broke all previous box office records in Asia and Bruce Lee was on his way to becoming an international star. But instead of taking his newfound celebrity status for granted, he pushed himself even harder. In his next film for Raymond Chow, Fist of Fury, Lee introduced the nunchaku, a weapon never before seen in a martial arts film. Once again, the film broke all box office records. But success has many rivals, and one of them was film producer Run Run Shaw. Hoping to steal Bruce away from Raymond Chow, he tempted the actor with a blank check for his services. Instead, Bruce remained loyal to Raymond Chow. He proposed an equal partnership for a series of films. It was an offer Chow couldn't and didn't refuse. Professionally confident and financially secure, Bruce Lee had conquered Asia. But his real goal had eluded him. Bruce Lee wanted to take on the world. In Hollywood, old habits die hard. And despite international fame as a martial arts superstar, Bruce Lee seemed no match for domestic prejudices. It was very difficult to convince people who could give a green light to a project that uh, 
an Asian hero would, would work as a marquee.